Hello everyone, this is Doc Ina, and the lecture for today is doing a history and physical examination in a pregnant patient. To download this slide or lecture deck for free, you can go to slideshare.net or go to my WordPress site. These are the references for this lecture. So first, let's do a complete pregnancy history. Obstetric history is very important to confirm the woman's suspicion of pregnancy, to make accurate fetal dating, and assess the general health of the mother and the fetus. This is also directed towards knowing what risk factors are there in the woman or that are known or suspected to diminish the health of either the woman or her developing fetus. But first, in order for you to obtain a good history and physical examination of the patient, here are some pointers for an effective physician communication. First, be culturally sensitive, and you have to establish rapport with your patient. You have to listen and respond to the woman's concern, and don't be judgmental. Include both verbal and nonverbal communication, engage your patient in discussion and treatment options, and you have to convey comfort in discussing sensitive topics, abandon stereotypes, check for understanding of your explanations, and of course, show support by helping the woman to overcome barriers to care and compliance with treatment. Here is the suggested outline in obtaining a good history of your patient. First, of course, is you have to ask for some social demographic details such as her name, what her age is, where she lives, her marital status, and occupation. Next is you ask her about her chief complaint. Usually, these patients just come to you for regular prenatal checkups. But some patients come to you with complaints of abdominal pain or bloody or watery discharge, which may signify that she might be in labor. Ask her about her history of present pregnancy, when she noted amenorrhea, and if assisted reproductive technique was performed, and when was it performed, or when pregnancy test was done. Ask her about her past medical and family history of chronic or genetic diseases such as diabetes mellitus, hypertension, cardiac conditions, asthma, and the like. Ask about her past obstetric history. Ask her about the gravidity and parity. Is this her first or is she a multi-gravid? Ask her about her birth outcomes from previous pregnancies such as the birth weight of her previous babies, the gender, or any major complications of pregnancy that she had in the past. And also ask her about history of premature birth or growth retarded infants. Update a personal and social history of the patient such as exposure to teratogenic chemicals or drugs, toxic substances, her smoking history, alcohol, or illicit drug use. Of course, you have to ask her about her menstrual history, ask her about her, the regularity of menses, and of course, the last menstrual period because that is where you will base the fetal age. Obtain past surgical and gynecologic history such as her history of OCP use and gynae infections. And lastly, ask about that antenatal course and what are the symptoms of pregnancy that she is experiencing like nausea, vomiting, breast tenderness, pelvic pain, and the like. Here are some of the ways in determining the fetal age. First, of course, is the Nagelis rule, which is used only for patients with regular menses or for patients who are sure of their last menstrual period or LMP. Okay, for patients who have irregular menses or do not even remember their LMP, then we can base fetal age based on uterine size, quickening, or the first trimester ultrasound scan. This is the Nagelis rule. So, we add 7 days to the first day of the last menstrual period, subtract 3 months, then add 1 year. For example, if your patient's LMP is July 5, 2016, so that's July 5 minus 3 months, that's April 5 plus 7 days, that's April 12, plus 1 year, that's April 12, 2017, as the estimated date of delivery. 
So the next part of the lecture is physical examination in a pregnant woman. In doing a physical exam, we must always make sure to always provide comfort and the sense of privacy for these patients. We always have to have the needed equipment readily at hand. We always have to provide gown and drapes for abdominal and pelvic exam. And of course, instruct the patient to empty her bladder prior to examination. So first, for the positioning of the patient, it is best to position them in a semi-sitting position like so with the knees bent supported by a pillow and this affords the greatest comfort for the patient. This is also good for protection from the negative effects of the weight of the gravid uterus on abdominal organs and vessels. As for the equipment, the examiner's hands are the primary equipment for examination of the pregnant woman and always remember to keep your hands warm and do physical examination of the pregnant woman very very gently. Avoid tender areas of the body until the end of the examination. Other equipment include speculum, tape measure, stethoscope, or a fetal Doppler. For the general examination of a pregnant woman, inspect her appearance. This includes inspection of the overall health of the woman, her nutritional status, emotional state, and neuromuscular coordination. Obtain also her weight, her height and compute for her body mass index. Also obtain her vital signs like her blood pressure, pulse rate, temperature. As for the examination of the head and neck, note for some skin pigmentation changes and you might note cloasma or melasma gravidarum. These are irregular brownish patches of varying size that appear on the face and the neck of the pregnant woman and this is the so-called mask of pregnancy. For the patient's hair, note the texture, moisture, and distribution. Is it dry or oily? Or do you note minor generalized hair loss which may be expected in some pregnant women? Inspect her eyes and look for signs of pallor. And this may be secondary to anemia of pregnancy. Inspect her nose and note for some nasal congestion or nose bleeding which are common among pregnant women. Inspect her gums and teeth. And note for some gingival enlargement with bleeding, which might be common. And also note for symmetrical enlargement in the thyroid. But marked enlargement in the thyroid is not normal during pregnancy. For the chest and lungs, inspect the thorax for pattern of breathing of the patient. Actually, there usually are no abnormal physical signs except some women who might experience labored breathing. For the heart, palpate the apical impulse. In advanced pregnancy, it may be slightly higher than the normal because of the dextro rotation of the heart due to the higher diaphragm secondary to the enlarging uterus. Also, auscultate the heart. You might note some soft blowing murmurs that might be common in pregnant women that reflects the increased blood flow in normal vessels. Inspect the breasts and nipple for symmetry and color. Nipples and areola in a pregnant woman become bigger and darker and the Montgomery glands are more prominent. You can compress the nipples very gently with the finger and the thumb and you might be able to express some colostrum from the nipples, especially from the second trimester and above. On inspection of the abdomen, you might note some skin changes and foremost of which would be Linnea nigra, which is the darkening of the Linnea alba. So from anatomy, you learn that Linnea alba is the midline of the abdominal skin that runs from the siphoid to the symphysis pubis. And the darkening of the Linnea alba is secondary to the, to the stimulation of melanophores by increase in the levels of melanocyte stimulating hormone during pregnancy. Also note for stria gravidarum, or what we call stretch marks. This is secondary to the separation of the underlying collagen tissue, secondary to stretching of the abdomen, and they appear as irregular scars. They are reddish to purplish in color during pregnancy, but they become silvery after delivery. Associated risk factors are weight gain during pregnancy, younger maternal age, and a family history. 
Under skin changes, we also have what we call diastasis recti. So occasionally, the muscles of the abdominal walls do not withstand the tension to which they are subjected. And as a result, the rectus muscles separate in the midline, creating diastasis recti. If severe, a considerable portion of the anterior uterine wall is covered by only a layer of skin, attenuated fascia, and a peritoneum to, ho to form the ventral hernia. Spider telangiectasia are vascular stellate marks resulting from high levels of estrogen. These marks blanch when pressure is applied. Palmar erythema is an associated sign and Spider telangiectasia usually typic or typically develops in the face, neck, upper chest, and arms. We also palpate the abdomen to determine the uterine size. A few slides back, I already mentioned that one of the ways of estimating fetal age is by determining the uterine size. For example, if we palpate the fundus of the uterus at around the level of the symphysis pubis, then the approximate fetal age is 12 weeks AOG or age of gestation. If we palpate the fundus of the uterus at around the umbilicus or the umbilical level, then the approximate fetal age is 20 weeks AOG. If we palpate the fundus of the uterus midway between the symphysis pubis and the umbilicus, then the approximate fetal age is around 16 weeks AOG. Another way of approximating fetal age is by determining the fundic height. And this involves the use of a tape measure. So, determining the fundic height is actually a linear measurement from the symphysis pubis to the uterine fundus. And we have to make sure that the patient emptied her bladder first. Fundic height correlates with AOG at 16 to 32 weeks AOG. So, for example, if the fundic height is around 20 centimeters, then the approximate fetal age is 20 weeks AOG. We also palpate the abdomen to feel for some fetal movement. In the examiner, or that's us, we may feel fetal movement after 24 weeks AOG. However, the mother can feel or perceive fetal movement as early as around 16 to 18 weeks, and that's what we call quickening. We can also palpate for uterine contractility, where the abdomen feels tense or firm, especially if the patient is in labor or probably near term. We can also palpate for some fetal parts, especially if the mother is not obese. Now, speaking of palpation of some fetal parts, let's do to you now Leupold's maneuver. So, Leupold's maneuver involves palpation of the fetal parts, and this is actually an abdominal exam to determine fetal presentation. So, Leupold's maneuver 1, or LM1, is called the fundal grip, where the uterine fundus is palpated to determine which fetal part occupies the fundus of the uterus. Fetal head would feel round and hard and balotable, while the fetal breech presents as a large and nodular mass. Leupold's maneuver 2, or LM2, is also called the umbilical grip. This is palpation of the paraumbilical areas or the sides of the uterus. And this is done to determine which side is the fetal back and which side are the fetal small parts. So the fetal back feels like a hard resistant convex structure while fetal small parts feel nodular or irregular. Leupold's maneuver 3 is also called Polex grip. This is a suprapubic palpation using thumb and fingers just above the symphysis pubis to determine fetal presentation and station. Leupold's maneuver 4 is also called pelvic grip, and this is palpation of the bilateral lower quadrants of the, to determine engagement of the fetal presenting part. If the fetal part is engaged, then the examiner's hands diverge. If the fetal head is not engaged, then the examiner's hands converge. We also do auscultation of the maternal abdomen to check for the fetal heartbeat. A few slides back, I introduced to you 
LM2 or Leupold's Maneuver 2, which is done to determine which side is the fetal back. And we have to determine which side is the fetal back because that is the area where we can hear the fetal heartbeat. So the fetal heart rate is usually at a range of 110 to 160 beats per minute. And we can detect this through the stethoscope starting 18 weeks AOG. And we can de detect fetal heartbeat earlier using a fetal Doppler at around 10 to 12 weeks AOG. We check also for the maternal extremities. So inspect the hands and legs for presence of edema. We palpate for pretibial, ankle, and pedal edema. Physiologic edema is more common in advanced pregnancy and in women who stand a lot. However, pathologic edema is often grade 3 plus and above and often associated with pregnancy-induced hypertension. We also check for leg varicosities. As for the genitalia, on inspection, we note the hair distribution, color, are there scars in, in, the, in the genitalia? Note for the parous relaxation of the introitus and noticeable enlargement of the labia and clitoris may be normal. Scars from previous episiotomy may be present or perineal lacerations also may be present. Inspect the anal area for varicosities and this may be hemorrhoids. Palpate the Bartholin and Skeen's glands and also check for cystocele or rectocele. On speculum exam of the genitalia, we note the changes in the vaginal mucosa, foremost of which would be Chadwick sign, which is a violaceous or bluish or purplish uh, discoloration of the vagina in the cervix, secondary to congestion due to the increase in vascularity of this area. There, you might also note some cervical changes, such as aversion, because the cervical glands undergo marked proliferation and by the end of pregnancy, they occupy up to one half of the entire cervical mass. Okay, so these are actually proliferating columnar in the cervical glands. Okay, so the, this tissue here tends to be red and velvety and bleeds even with minor trauma such as when you do pap smear sampling. On speculum exam also, you take note of vaginal discharge. Is there watery or whitish, foul-smelling, curd-like, bloody discharge? And any lesions, warts, foreign body, tumorous growth, and the like. On bimanual and internal examination, note for the Heger sign, or this is the softening of the uterine isthmus, resulting in its compressibility on bimanual exam. This is observed by the 6 to 8 week AOG. AOG. Also note for the Goodell sign, which is the cyanosis and softening of the cervix, which may occur as early as 4 weeks AOG. We do internal examination and we estimate the length of the cervix by palpating the lateral surface of the cervix from the cervical tip to the lateral fornix. And prior to 34 to 36 weeks, cervix should retain its normal length of about 1.5 to 2 centimeters. A shortened or effaced cervix prior to 32 weeks may indicate preterm labor. On internal examination, note if the cervix is closed or dilated. And if the cervix is dilated, please take note of the following. Estimate the approximate size of dilatation in centimeters. Note the fetal station. What is the fetal presenting part? Is it cephalic or breech? Or if the bag of waters is intact or ruptured? And finally, once the examination is completed, instruct the patient to get dressed. And once she is dressed, review all your findings with your patient and answer all your patient's questions. Advise necessary laboratory or ancillary procedures the patient may need based on your examination. Reinforce the importance of regular prenatal checkups and finally, record all your findings in the chart or patient records.